I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with episode 110 of Ask Dave. Today we're going to take a look at more antenna modeling. I've got this uh, great book right here that uh, I've been using to put together a number of videos to explain how antennas work and how they behave under different conditions and so on. It's a marvelous thing to be able to do this. I have had questions from people as to how to understand the uh, graphical outputs, what they mean, and so on. So that's what we'll spend a little time doing today is just understanding the output of the Easy NEC modeling so we can kind of all be on the same page of what it means. All right, we're going to start with a whole bunch of charts here. And the very first thing we're going to do is look at this term right here, model. A model is uh, some representation of an object in some way that emulates it in some meaningful way. Okay, for example, let's take this battery right here. Okay, it's a 12 volt battery. Uh, it's uh, 8 amp hours, AGM, it's kind of heavy and so on. I could model this by making a box this size to look just like this. It'd be light as a feather, but I could make a box do that. Now, how that, in what way would that be a useful model? Well, if I'm looking for where to put the battery, that would be a useful model. But if I was looking to that to see how heavy it was, then that would not be a useful model. So I might use a, a chunk of lead or something to give this much weight. That would model the weight, but not necessarily the size. Another thing I could do is just simply model it as a source of 12 volts and just draw a circle and uh, say 12 volts. Okay, lots of different ways of modeling it. And you model it differently depending on why you're doing the modeling, okay, what you're trying to get out of it. So a model is some useful representation of an object that emulates it in some meaningful way. Now, we're going to use uh, easy NEC okay and use this book um, modeling antenna modeling for beginners that's available from the ARRL website for $34.95 not cheap but worth it um, it's a useful representation great okay let's go to the the next chart which is actually the uh, opening screen you get with easy NEC easy meaning easy, of course, E-A-S-Y, easy, uh, numerical electrical electromagnetic code, okay? Version 6, I have easy NEC+. Plus. There are several versions of it, okay? Let's just study this screen just for a little bit. We've got your usual stuff at the top, file where you can edit and options, outputs. Over here on the side... This is where you can open a saved file or save a file. And I do point out this little thing here, which is sometimes neglected. If you, you can put in here anything you want to, to remind yourself about why you were doing this antenna. You can put dates in there. You can put anything like that. And then they will stay with the file. Okay, now this is your main set of inputs. So we're using a file called backyarddipole.ez is the extension for easy NEC. Uh, we tell it the frequency and it tells us the wavelength. Okay, now this wavelength is based on a 100% velocity factor. So don't let it throw you. Uh, when you're dealing with wire, you're usually dealing with something about 95% uh, velocity factor. Uh, this right here, if you click this, you get another file. In, in fact, as you go down here, each one of these is an input. And these over here are outputs. Okay. So these may be a little bit uh, weird. That's why they give you a bunch of models to start with that you can modify. Loading transmission lines, transformers, and L networks all have to do with adding some reactants to the antenna to make it work better, like loading coils and uh, uh, quarter wave uh, transmission lines and so on. We won't worry about those right now. 
Now ground, a lot of the antennas are made with uh, a ground that is, um, they say free space. I have yet to meet an, an amateur radio operator who lives in free space. Um, even the astronauts on the shuttle have those antennas mounted to the shuttle itself, which acts as the ground plane for those antennas. So I see no reason to model an antenna in free space. I always put it over ground of some kind. I just call it real ground. There's little things you can tweak on it if you want. You don't have to. Uh, this gives you the ground description from the ground type. Wire loss here is zero, but we're going to put copper in here later for the copper connectivity. Feet, you can have it in meters, millimeters, inches, whatever you want. Plot types are elevation uh, and uh, the plan view from the top is the azimuthal diagram and uh, then you can also get a 3D plot. We'll look at all of those. Okay, The azimuth angle is where you want uh, the azimuthal pattern to start at. Um, the step size, one degree, is usually pretty good. Uh, uh, the, the reference level, now this is important here. Zero dBi means your reference to an isotropic antenna. And that's where all your gains and stuff are. Remember to subtract off about 2.1, 2.2 or so uh, from that to get the gain relative to a dipole. Now even that is a little bit fraught because a dipole is directional. So it will have more than that gain in some directions and less in others. Okay, and then they do give you an interesting option if you're using different kinds of cable. Everything in Easy NEC is designed around 50 ohms, okay? However, if you want to feed it with a different cable, you can put that in here and you could choose, this would be like RG6 or something like that. And then the description options you can modify in your antenna notes, okay? Out here come a table of currents, a table of source data, a table of load data, um, and here you can choose between far field and near field. Okay, that's, that's all great, but what people are really interested in seeing are the SWR. They want to look at the antenna, and they want to get the far field plot. Far field means far enough away from the antenna that all of the electromagnetic radiation can sort itself out because the near field it's a confused mess it doesn't look anything like what it's going to be in the far field interestingly the further you go up in frequency and the more gain you put in it the longer the far field uh, the longer the near field is before you get to far field um, it's not something we usually worry about when we talk about an antenna we're usually talking about its far field radiation pattern okay so let's take a look now. Now we'll take this one here. Okay, these are the wires. Now in Easy NEC, everything's made of a wire. Now that doesn't mean that it's actually wires. It could be lengths of uh, aluminum tubing or something like that. But every section of an antenna is referred to as a wire. So we're going to take our backyard dipole and it's got one wire. Now they don't take into account the fact that it's cut in the middle and fed there. It's still one wire because the way they're going to do it here is we've got um, 11 segments so it's going to take the middle segment and that's where it's going to feed it. Okay so we have a wire the first end is uh, 30 feet above the origin the Y end is uh, 30 feet away and the ZN is still 30. Now after you do this you kind of want to did, 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 did I make this uh, work right? So we go to the next one which is the actual picture of the antenna. Now look carefully these little green dots are segment boundaries. Because we said there were going to be 11 segments. It's in the middle segment. Break it in the middle is where it's fed. Uh, so that's the feed point right there. Now, 
the thing that's important about this is the way the code works. You know, in in nature, each atom on here is radiating separately. Each copper atom, uh, the electrons in it are, but that's too much to model because there's you know hundreds of gazillions of billions of zillions of molecules in there. So we break it into segments, and we treat this segment as a point source. This is a point source, and so on. Okay, so that's our antenna right there. It's just a dipole. We don't show it hanging down in a catenary like a normal dipole would or anything like that. Uh, you can actually add wires in here and you can use this particular screen as I'll show later on to kind of rotate it around to get an idea. It's 30 feet up and it's 33 uh, feet long. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is the far field radiation pattern. This is your dipole and this is in the direction of the maximum radiation. It doesn't have to be but it is. Right there, that little point right there, we're looking at the antenna end, end on. Looking at the antenna end on. Okay, so it's going to radiate in both directions. Now the green line over here is the line of the angle of radiation where it has the maximum strength. So that's about 33 degrees. Now, there's, uh, you, you may have noticed in there um, a little uh, cursor. There was a little circle that's put right at the maximum. You can actually move that around, but the cursor elevation you see here is... 33 degrees. So that is the max radiation angle. However, if we want to look at the beam width, beam width is usually defined as the 3 dB point on either side. So we take as a reference 0 dB being the max radiation right here. Okay. And this tells us right down here that the actual gain at the max point right there is 6.82 dBi. So the beam width is where you're 3 dB down. There's 1, 2, 3. So there's 3 dB down from, from there. And we can keep going down here till we get to the other 3 dB down. This distance right here, this angular distance, is 41.5 degrees, okay? Okay, now note that everything that applies over here also applies over on this side. So at this point right here, at 33 degrees, it's actually, you subtract 2.4 from that for dipole, it's still a 40 dB gain in this direction. But you get losses up in here and down here and so on. Notice that below this angle, we're getting very little radiation. Okay, So the side lobe gain is this at an elevation angle, and that's right up here. So the, the system is referring to this as your main lobe, and this is the biggest side lobe in here. All right, I think we've beat this chart to death. I want to uh, do now the SWR. Uh, you can choose either the standard 50 ohms or what an alternative uh, would give you. Right here, I'm going to say this antenna is actually a little bit too uh, uh, short because it actually resonates over here at a too high frequency. So we'd probably want to add a little bit. Now, the source. It's 50 ohms, but the actual impedance, we get our SWR in here. What's driving the impedance is this. Here we have a reactive component uh, here, quite a significant one, okay, uh, which works out to be this if you use uh, the resistive part and then the reactive part separately. Minus J, it's capacitive. Um, it's, uh, let me think for a second. 
To make an antenna seem longer, you add inductance. Okay, this antenna seems too short, so it's capacitive, right? By that much. Here's your reflection coefficient and the return loss. Uh, not very much, actually. Okay, so this is actually a fairly good radiator. If you, any modern radio can tune anything below about that, you'll be fine. Although, I think I would want to lengthen it just a little bit. Now, we don't talk about this a lot, but the fact is there's almost always some reactants in the antenna. If you want to take an antenna that's too short and has capacitive uh, reactants, you can add inductance. So we could add to this, since it's too short, it's at too high frequency, we could add a little bit of inductance right at the feed line if we wanted to. It's something you can do if you want, but you don't have to. And like I said, this thing is well within the ability of a modern radio to tune and tune it down absolutely uh, beautifully. Okay, page down. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this chart here. Okay. Again, here's our three degree, and this is now horizontally. Okay, plan view, we're looking straight down on the antenna. Now, this pattern here is the radiation pattern. Now, let me tell you what it does not mean, and then I will tell you what it does mean. This is not the line of equal power. In other words, this is, it's all by convention shown to the east. If that does not mean if I've got a reception antenna, say this is 100 miles east and this is north, okay, that does not mean if I put a house here, which would be closer, that I would get the same radiation here. That is not what it means. What it means is if I put a house here, okay, I will receive something that's about 13 dB lower in power than this, okay? This right here is a measure of signal strength for points on the compass going around it. So over here, the west station has the same power as the east station. The south station has the same power as the north station and so on because of this symmetric pattern here. And if you put a receiver here, assuming propagation is wonderful, let's say it's NVIS and, and we're getting to everybody very easily, this person's reception would be five, six, seven dB down, okay? Now this dipole again uh, is an ideal dipole in actual practice, it's a little bit rounder. So let's look at the elevation angle. We are looking at the azimuth plot and an elevation angle of 15 degrees. Because at an elevation angle of zero degrees, there's nothing. Uh, you've got to come up a little bit off the horizon for it to do that. So the outer ring here is 3.48 dBi, which would be the gain here over an isotropic. Okay, and it gives you a bunch of other numbers that you can play with. Here, the beam width 82 degrees, almost 90 degrees, okay, uh, which would give you the 3 dB beam width, and then it's in this area here, in these directions, that it's not so good, assuming it's an ideal dipole. Now, uh, what I want to do is take another example here. This is one of the pre-supplied models here. Now note, a couple things, it's in free space, I don't like that, we're going to fix that. Wire loss is zero, that's not realistic. Um, and so we're going to make a couple of mods. Note that we have nothing weird going on here in terms of deliberately added reactants of any kind. Note that there's 55 wires and a total of 95 segments. That's because this is a complicated antenna. It's a 20 meter, five element Yegi, okay? And everything's done in inches for some reason. Okay, so 
First thing I want to do is change the Z from zero to something else. So um, I did that, as you can see here. And uh, what I did, unfortunately, see, I changed the height by uh, 30, which was going to be uh, the number of feet that I had in here. Okay. And uh, 34 feet. Okay. And I hit OK. And then I realized that what I had done was to make it uh, 34 <laughs> inches, uh, which obviously isn't very good. So let's go to the next one where I do the change in here to change the height. You can actually move the antenna, change the height, and so on. And uh, I moved it from uh, 34 uh, up to the, uh, see I went down here to the wire table, I had the wire table, a group modify, okay, and then I changed the 34. This, this modification does everything. I'm going to change the height by, and I'm going to add in another 408 inches, which is about the equivalent of 34 feet. Okay. Now, that allows us to look at the antenna right here and see what's going on. Uh, quite a few things are going on. This is uh, static here. This is showing the antenna. Uh, this is X, Y, and this is Z up here. So we're looking way down at it like we were a drone. Um, and what's going on here, these multiple little pieces of wire are actually different diameters of tubing. Okay, now that makes a little bit of a difference in the way something radiates the kind of uh, reactivity it has and um, the the resistance because the RF flows on the surface a smaller tube means smaller surface okay now having done that I want to look at a beam pattern of that and the uh, beam pattern which we see here goes strongly out in one direction Okay, and you can kind of look at that. Notice there's nothing under here. It immediately starts to skip right away. It's 20 meter antenna. Uh, so there's really very little ground wave here. After all, this is a horizontal antenna. Okay, let's take a look at the beam width here. Here's our, our uh, max radiation angle. And the, the cursor is actually over here. <laughs> so we get the elevation of 48 there. Here we're 5, 10, 15, 20, about 22 degrees, okay, for our elevation angle, which is not bad for dx. Let's look at our beam width. Again, 3 dB points. The beam width is 25 degrees, as low as 10.7, as high as 36.5. That is, this region in here is considered to be the beam width. Now, the um, it will also give you the side lobe gain. Um, this is essentially front to back right here. Um, the side lobe gain is minus six to way down here. Um, and we've got, uh, well, again, we've got this here. So let's add 10 dB to that. 13 dB gain would be about right for a five element, uh, a five element. Yegi. Okay, continuing to move. This is what it looks like from the top. Again, the elevation angle is not right on the ground. We've picked an elevation angle, 22 degrees, to look at what the azimuth pattern is. We see that we have little side lobes here. You cannot avoid side lobes. You can't. The way the mathematics works, there is going to be radiation in places other than in front of you. It's just a, f a law of physics. It may seem strange. You'd think you could send all your radiation in one direction and what this tells you is you can't, no matter how hard you try, no matter what kind of side lobe suppression you try, there's still going to be some side lobes, uh, which is something that 
<laughs> can be exploited if you want to. I mean, you could actually have a station come in on your side lobe and you say, aha, where are you? Then you can rotate the beam to make things much better. But there is never a case where you will have a single lobe of radiation with no back lobe, side lobes, and so on. You can't do it. Mother Nature won't do it. Okay, now we want to run the SWR for this. You tell it where to start, where to end, at what points, okay, and you click uh, run here, and uh, this is what you come up with here. It's kind of a weird looking little thing. It makes you think there's more to it, doesn't it? This is the 20 meter band all the way from 14 to 1435. And we're down here to about two and a half. And the reason for that, if we look down here, here's your resistance, 21.74. Ooh, okay. 21.74, and we're feeding it with 50 ohm line. Seems like we need a transformer in there of some kind, a ballon. Um, or, uh, well, it would be a, a yeah, unbell, whatever, from your 50 ohm coax. It's only 21.74 ohms. So we may have to play games to feed this right. But if you feed it straight with 50 ohms, this is what you get. You also get a uh, reactive part. And again, it's minus. You could add a tad of inductance or just make the uh, antenna a little bit longer. All right. Now, if we didn't really know where the resonance of our system was, we could uh, go, go for this and make this number much lower, like say three, and make this number much higher, like say 30, okay? And we'd have to make this number larger too, because otherwise uh, it would take forever to calculate. And then we calculate that and we come up with a table like this. See, there's our 3 and our 30 right there. Here is the weird little uh, shape of the curve. Note that you could get hung up on this. Um, see, it's 14.3 where we have our lowest SWR. Um, see right up here we've got a false dip if we had a false dip up here we might get ourselves hung up trying to find the lowest SWR in here whereas we actually have to go quite a ways off this is a very tightly tuned antenna I, I bring this up because um, a uh, fan brought to my attention something that she was trying to do and she sent her model I couldn't figure out what it was, and so I ran a plot just like this uh, from 3 to 30 uh, megahertz and found that it uh, radiated quite well at 12. So it either has to be lengthened a little bit to be a 10 megahertz antenna or shortened a little bit to be a 14 megahertz antenna. You could go either way. It was a, an interesting shape, one that, one that actually could work. It just needed to be tweaked um, a tiny bit. So uh, what we have learned is about inputs and outputs for easy NEC and the graphical outputs are the ones that are really interesting uh, for standing wave ratio for uh, radiation patterns and we can tell a great deal about our antenna design. Again, Easy NEC is not a design program. It is an analysis program. You design something, put it in there, and see what it does. Now, obviously, from that, you can get a very good idea of what you need to do to change your design uh, to make it work better. Now, again, a model is not reality. If you really wanted a perfect model of a five element beam on a 50 foot tower, then go build a 50 foot tower and put a five element beam on top of it. That's the only way you're going to find out. Of course, if you move that to some new landscape, it'll be different. So modeling gives us an idea, sometimes a very good idea uh, about performance, but like any model, garbage in, garbage out. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, 
an idea that I've been thinking about that I wanted to uh, run uh, by everybody. Uh, I see a lot of other channels where the viewers, subscribers uh, call themselves uh, by a name. Uh, you've got Justin Bieber who has his believers, it's a silly thing, but, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not really a Justin Bieber fan, uh, that's for somebody far, far younger than me. But I was wondering, OG is the symbol that I use for the channel. Uh, we could call it, that would be pronounced Og, we could call ourselves Oggies. That, uh, that what we've got going here is the Augie channel for Augies, O-G-G-I-E-S. Now, there is one caveat. I looked that up in Wikipedia, and it turns out that an Augie is a kind of Scottish pastry. So, I don't know if you want to be called a Scottish pastry, but, um, you know, for every word, there's something somewhere in the world, but, yeah, O-G-G-I-E or O-G-G-I-E-S for the plural. So let me know what you think of that. Uh, oh, I got one more other thing. YouTube has changed the discussion tab on the channel to a much more interactive forum, a place where I can put up notifications and talk to people and channel news and so on. Um, and I'm going to explain that in, in the next uh, video. So um, for Everybody out there, all you Augies, 73. Next week, we'll take a closer look at the QRP Labs QCX transceiver on the air. Also, check out next week's video and last week's video, and don't forget to subscribe.